Things didn't start getting weird immediately. I'd been in my new place at least four months before I noticed anything. At the end of 2017, I was given a promotion and had to move to a new city. I was fortunate in that my company located the duplex for me. They also went as far as paying the deposit and first month's rent. So, once it came down to relocating, a lot of the hard work had been done. On my first meeting with Neil, the landlord, I didn't get any bad feelings. In fact, he seemed like a normal, nice guy. He didn't lurk around or ask a bunch of questions. I was given the keys and wish good luck. That was it. Two weeks later, I began my new job and was too busy to notice anything was out of the ordinary. However, when that weekend came along, the strangeness started. I just bought three new pairs of underwear the week I moved in. For some reason, two pairs were missing from my dresser. I checked the dirty clothes. They weren't there and neither was my favorite t-shirt. I could recall the exact moment I threw it into the basket. No matter where I searched, I came up empty-handed. Oh well, I thought, and purchased two new pairs to replace them. It wasn't the first time I'd lost clothes. I went on with my life and put it into the back of my mind. Monday came back around and I returned to work. I paid little attention to the state of my surroundings. Friday evening, I arrived home dead on my feet and crashed early. The following morning, I was making breakfast and noticed a pair of faint footprints on the tile. It looked as if though they had been half-heartedly mopped away. I went to check my mop and couldn't find it. Eventually, I found it stuck next to the broom in the pantry. I knew for a fact I didn't put it there. I'd learned from my mom long ago to store it in the mop bucket when I wasn't using it. This was the first instance in which I feared someone was entering my home while I was gone. It would only get worse from there. After that, I looked around the rest of the house, but nothing else seemed different. This caused me to question my instincts again. The tracks could have been there before I moved in. Maybe I just didn't notice. As for the mop, I suppose I could have misplaced it when I was moving in. Although at the end of the day I'd more or less discounted my suspicions... They never fully left the front of my mind. From now on, I would be on high alert for any anomalies showing up around the house. Nothing would pique my interest for the next few weeks. Then, on a Saturday morning as I put things together for the laundry, I realized I was short on underwear again. Now, I was missing three pairs. Two of the new ones in a pair I'd had over a year or more. All the doubt I'd had before was gone. I was sure somebody was stealing my clothes. There were no signs of forced entry. It had to be Neil or potentially a previous tenant. I hadn't thought to ask if the locks had been changed. I didn't rule out the prior resident, but my gut told me Neil was responsible. Before I went to the police and accused a possibly innocent man, I needed proof. I did some research and found out about motion-activated cameras... I ordered two from Amazon and placed them in different rooms. These things weren't any bigger than a book of matches, so I was fairly confident that they'd go unnoticed. All that was left was the wait. A week passed and nothing showed up. Another with the same result. I was beginning to believe that I was imagining it all. At the end of week three, I didn't hold much hope in finding anything. That Saturday afternoon when I plugged it in, I wasn't even really paying much attention. Then the pictures loaded, and I almost choked on my soda. One by one, my intruder showed himself. When I finally got the clear shot of his face I'd been waiting for, a feeling of extreme disappointment filled me. As I feared, Neil was indeed the trespasser. Not much else really showed up on the first camera. A sickening feeling of dread overcame me as I brought up the photos on the second. The first few didn't show anything I didn't already suspect. I continued to watch as he carefully searched through the drawers. The real bad stuff came when he opened the hamper. I wasn't prepared for what I was about to see. As I began sniffing the first pair of underwear, I was confused. But when he did what he did next, I almost wretched. I fought against this urge for quite some time. 
Fortunately, he didn't go any further, if that's even possible. I managed to make it through to the end where he put the now soiled underwear into his pocket and walked out of the frame. I'd gotten what I'd asked for and now I regretted it. Not only was I about to lose my home, I had to let a group of total strangers see perhaps the most embarrassing secret of my life. Regardless of my feelings, I had to finish what I'd started. Monday morning, I called in sick and drove to the police station. After filing my complaint, I returned to the house and began transporting my things to storage. Luckily for me, I hadn't yet unpacked most of my stuff, so I was finished before midnight. I checked into a hotel near work and waited for everything to blow up, and it didn't take long. I was at my desk that Wednesday when I was notified of Neil's arrest. He made bail that same day, and things went quiet for six months or more after that. In the interim, I worked and searched for a new place. I was fortunate to find an apartment within the month and moved in on the first of the following one. The day I'd been waiting for had finally arrived just as the first buds broke on the trees. Neil had accepted a deal from the district attorney for a fine and six months in jail. It turned out he had done something similar to another woman and gotten off with a slap on the wrist prior. I was happy with the result overall. Honestly, I was just happy to get away from him. And in the time since, life has gone back to near normal except for one thing. My sense of security in my home has taken a hit. In a year and a half, I've lived in three separate places. The day I get my keys, I spend hours searching every nook and cranny for cameras, microphones, and any other peeping device you can think of. I also change the locks almost immediately just to ensure I'm the only person with a key. If a situation comes up that a repairman has to fix something, I insist on being present during that time. I guess you could say my sense of trust has been destroyed and you might be right. At least this way, I know my underwear will be where I left them when I get home. Up until I was 34, I spent the majority of my time in and out of jail and prison. I'm not going to make some boohoo excuse. I grew up in a rough neighborhood. The guys that were the most respected were crooks and I wanted to be like them. So around 12, I teamed up with a group of other kids. We dealt a little dope, but made most of our cash from smash and grabs. And by my 18th birthday, I had been arrested more than five times. I was obviously not a good criminal, but I was far from learning my lesson. In the early 2000s, I was bouncing from place to place, my girlfriend at the time constantly complained about how much time I was spending with my friends. I'd live with her for a few weeks and we'd get into a big argument and I'd crash on a friend's couch. A few days later, we'd make up and I'd move back in only to repeat the cycle. Probably after doing this four or five times, I've had enough and decided to get my own place. I put the word out in the street and within a few weeks, I got a call. I'd done business stuff with this guy in the past fencing stolen stuff, and I knew he owned several properties. He said he had this house that had been broken into by kids on two occasions, and he wanted somebody to live there. All he wanted was a couple of hundred bucks to cover the utilities, and I jumped on it. No way was I going to get a better offer anywhere else. I moved my stuff in and was just getting comfortable when I got another call from this guy telling me I had to move out. I was livid. We made a deal that I could stay there for at least six months. I hadn't been there too. I reminded him of this, but he didn't care. His new girlfriend needed a place to live, and I was in the way. I figured it would take him a few months just to get the paperwork required to evict me, so I told him to call his lawyers. I blamed myself for what happened next. I should have known he wouldn't take no for an answer. I continued hustling and doing what I needed to pay the bills, I hadn't heard from the landlord in over a week. Then, without warning, I was awakened by a pair of men. I heard this loud banging noise in the kitchen. When I ran out to investigate, I met eye to eye with a man pounding on a pot. Sitting in a chair next to him was another man. When I say men, I'm 
not accurately describing them. They were more like giants. Both were easily over 6 foot 3 and 250 pounds. I was furious but still too tired to make a scene. When I inquired as to their purpose in waking me up at 5 a.m., I was told my landlord had sent them. If I wasn't so groggy, I probably would have caught on that they weren't there just to tell me this. Instead, I asked them to pass on a message. I'm not going anywhere until my lease expires. Except I didn't word it in such a congenial manner. My visitors appeared to be unfazed. In return, they informed me that the landlord had a message of his own. I could vacate the property within half an hour or those men would take me out to the middle of nowhere and dump me into a deep hole. And that certainly got my attention, and I knew he meant it. With no other choice, I packed as fast as possible and checked into the first hotel I saw. There were a few things I was forced to leave behind, but nothing worth my life. I'd eventually find a permanent place to crash. Unfortunately, it was at a state correction center. After doing three years of a five-year sentence, I returned to the streets once again without a home of my own. My brother was kind enough to let me ride his couch for a few months until I got back on my feet. I was determined never to return to jail, and even though finding a legit job was a bit of an ordeal, I've managed it going on five years. Since I now move in a much different world, most of those from my past are just that, in my past. My former friend and landlord would be among them. I was recently sitting at the dinner table in my current home reading the paper. About halfway down the page, a familiar name caught my notice. It appears that very same man was on trial for murdering his partner over a business disagreement. Reading this drove home to me how wise my decision was that morning. Had I listened to my ego, I probably would have ended up the same way. Ever since I was a small child, I've been entranced by computers. They're in my blood and I learned how they worked as soon as I could. This love led me to a profitable career in programming. At 12, I designed my first web page for a friend at school. It all grew up from there. I was making over $25,000 a year by 14. I'd been setting aside money for college for some time. However, at 16, I used a hunk of it to buy my first car. It wasn't anything extreme, just a two-year-old F-150 with all the bells and whistles. When I came home with it, my parents were livid. They thought a dealership had sold it to me, but when I explained I had got it from an ad in Auto Trader, they yelled about the cost. Although I still had another $37,000 in the bank, they demanded I return it. I'd bought it fair and square with my own money, so... I held my ground and refused. When they realized I wasn't going to budge on the truck, they demanded that I give them my savings for safekeeping, they said. This wasn't going to happen either. They tried to pull the as long as you live under our roof power play, so I called them on it. I grabbed some clothes and my computer and took off. The first night I pulled off on a deserted back road and slept in my truck. During my breaks at school, I looked through a couple of sites like Craigslist and Facebook for any rooms for rent locally. At lunch, I found a listing on Facebook that caught my eye. I sent the OP an email. She returned my message and we set up a meeting later in the day. When I arrived, I was taken aback at the woman's age. She had said she was a widow in her email, so I naturally expected a grandma. The woman that met me at the door couldn't have been over 40. I was concerned she'd know that I wasn't 19 like I'd said. Fortunately for me, I had bought a fake ID online the year prior and when she asked me for proof, I showed her that. She must have believed me. When I told her I wanted the room, she gave me a piece of paper to sign and took my money. It was that simple. Just like that, I had a place of my own. I was elated to be out from under the thumbs of my folks. I went out that evening and bought myself one of those mini fridges and stocked it with Red Bull. In my mind, I was grown up and nobody was going to have control over me ever again. For the sake of the story, I'll call my new landlady Darlene. 
Darlene was under the belief that I worked in IT at a national mortgage company. This made leaving for school every morning easier to explain. I'd come back every afternoon and spend the rest of the evening in my room. One afternoon after I'd been there for about a month, Darlene asked if I ever ate. Of course I did, but I was living off of prepackaged garbage that I didn't have to cook. As soon as she found this out, she insisted that I let her cook me dinner. I was missing my mom's cooking, to be honest, so I accepted her offer. Before I knew it, she was doing this every day. I felt a bit guilty, like I was taking advantage of her kindness. She seemed to love doing it, so I assumed she missed her son, who was off at college, so I held my tongue. Then things got weird. One evening, i just finished eating and she returned from the kitchen. I was about to get up from the table and she walked up behind me. With no warning, she started massaging my shoulders. The situation was a little uncomfortable, but the massaging did feel good. After about a minute, I tried to thank her and get up from the table. I stood up and turned to wish her a good evening. She gave me this seductive look and began rubbing my chest. And now I was freaking out. Things had gone way beyond weird. I wasn't sure what to do, so I did the worst thing I could have. I pushed her hands away. The hurt registered on her face right away, and I felt really guilty now. I tried to soothe her bruised ego by making up some stupid excuse I'd seen on a movie. I said something really cringy like, It's not your fault, Dylane. It's me. She saw right through that and demanded I tell her the truth. And I could see she was about to cry. In a panic, I told her everything. I'm only 16. I'm really sorry I lied to you, but it wouldn't be right if we did this. I do find you attractive, but I, I just don't want to get you in trouble. I was actually more afraid of the act itself than her getting caught. I still hadn't even barely kissed a girl yet. Doing that kind of stuff with a grown woman terrified me. I knew I should have kept my mouth shut, but I'd never been able to lie very well, especially to my mom. I guess Darlene reminded me of her a little. She pushed me away, and I watched in horror as the bright blue of her eyes morphed into a dark brownish green. She gritted her teeth and started yelling, liar, at the top of her lungs. The louder her voice grew, I stepped further away. I had never seen another person that angry in my life. I was literally shaking in fear. I attempted to explain, but her screams drowned me out. Something I said must have angered her even more. Her eyes bugged out and an evil snarl appeared on her upper lip. An object on the table caught her eye. She reached for it and came away with a big carving knife. I knew it was razor sharp. I'd used it less than an hour prior to slice the turkey breast, and I wasn't sticking around after this. She clearly wasn't thinking straight. The second I saw the knife, I turned and ran from my room. I slammed the door behind me and locked it. I knew Darlene had a key, so I had to work fast. I picked up a duffel bag from the closet and crammed it full of clothes. With the bag under my arm and my laptop in the other hand, I hopped out of the window and ran from my truck. I sped away still shivering in terror. So now, I was homeless once more. I pulled over into a nearby park. After an hour of brainstorming, I remembered a senior that had his own place. I called him and got the okay to crash on his couch. That's where I slept for the next week. At least five times a day, my phone would chime with a text or voice message from Darlene. They were terrifying in their bipolarness. One would be begging for me to come back only for the next to be cursing and wishing death upon me. During that week, I did a lot of soul searching. I decided to extend the olive branch towards my folks in hopes that we could come to some compromise and I could return home. We were eventually able to make a deal. I would give them 50% of my income to set back for my college and I would get to keep my truck. It was a small thing in the end. I can understand their concern. They had my future in mind. That first night back in my own bed was like heaven. The entire mess had been a huge wake-up call for me. 
I've been taking my folks for granted for a long time. When you're a kid making more than most adults around you, it can happen easily. That's probably how I found it so easy to lie to Darlene. Until I saw the damage my arrogance could cause firsthand, I never thought about it. I wish I could apologize for my actions, but I fear that ship sailed a long time ago. The last thing I want to do is tear open a healed wound, and despite her extreme reactions to my lies, she was a good person and deserved to be treated with respect. And, as weird as it sounds, I hope she has that now. After my mom passed in 2015, I became the owner of my childhood home. I had purchased my own house almost 10 years before, so I was unsure of what to do with it. I struggled for some time whether to sell or rent it out. Ultimately, I went with the renting option. In this way, I could earn money to pay the taxes at the end of the year. If I wanted to sell later on, I'd be able to. My first tenants were a family of four who stayed for just 12 months. I was very sad to see them go. Their check always arrived on time and they maintained the house like it was their own. With them gone, I put up a new ad on the internet and a few local newspapers. It wasn't long before I found four college students looking for a new house. I knew I was taking a risk renting to four young men, but I liked the kids. The first test would be whether the rent arrived on time. They had it to me a day early. Every month after that was the same. With no reason to bother them, I left them alone to focus on school. Five months passed before I got a phone call. Mr. Glenn, an elderly gentleman living catty corner from the house, contacted to say that he had concerns about the new residence. He claimed people were coming and going at all times of the day and night and Their cars were clogging up the street. I took his complaints with a grain of salt. He was retired with nothing better to do but spy on his neighbors. I also thought a lot of it had to do with two of the boys not being white. That area has always been overwhelmingly racially homogenous and some of the older residents had a hard time seeing things change. I reminded him that they were students. People coming and going wasn't out of the ordinary. As for the cars... I said I'd talk to them about it. After I got rid of him, I put it out of my mind. Without any real problems from them, I wasn't going to cause trouble. I didn't believe that there was a problem until a younger neighbor sent me an email. A girl I went to school with lived in a few houses down from my renters. She repeated Mr. Glenn's complaint about the constant traffic. In addition to this, she recounted a run-in that she had had with one of the visitors. The visitor had parked in front of her mailbox... She asked as kindly as she could if they could move. An argument followed in which she was threatened by this visitor. She could clearly see a handgun tucked into his waistband, so she backed off. Now I had no choice but to take their concerns seriously. I decided to make an unannounced visit. Rather than confront them directly, I parked down the street and watched the comings and goings of the house. I returned three days in a row and the traffic was almost constant in that time. From what I knew about college students, being one myself before, I was positive that they were not students. Based on other life experiences, I was almost certain that they were dealing drugs out of the house. It was the only thing that made sense. Even if they weren't selling dope, the people they surrounded themselves with were putting me in financial danger, not to mention the other residents in actual physical danger. I contacted my attorney and he filed the paperwork needed to evict them. Soon after, the constable served them the notice. They called me, of course, to inquire why, and I let them know that I was aware of what they were doing. The young man I spoke to put up a half-hearted denial, but I was confident I was in the right. Three weeks later, I received an email notifying me that they had vacated the house. Most of it was made up of cursing and closed with a cryptic threat to my life. I laughed it off and headed over to see the state that they had left the house in. Much as I had expected, holes were in the walls and a couple of windows had been broken. I was relieved it wasn't worse. Nothing a few hundred dollars and some spackle couldn't fix. I did the repairs myself and prepared to put it up for rent again. 
The very same night I finished repairing the damage, my former tenants paid me a visit. Around 1.30 a.m., I was dead to the world and a crashing noise woke me up. The living room was already fully engulfed when I got there. After a brief attempt at putting it out with a dinky extinguisher, I gave up and called 911. They couldn't save the house, unfortunately. To add insult to injury, I found a hole spray painted on my car that morning, and that removed any doubt I may have had. I suppose in the end I was more fortunate than most folks. I still had a second house. My fingers were crossed as I turned the corner. A real cunning adversary would have burned that place too, but it was fortunately still standing. Just to lower the chances of them coming after me a second time, I parked in the garage to make the place look uninhabited. With nothing more than a mattress in tow, I did my best to make myself comfortable. And comfortable I am. I have yet to move, and not sure if I ever will. I've had a lot of time to think, and I have come to believe it was all meant to be. Returning here has filled a void inside me. Don't get me wrong, I would have rather not almost been burned alive, but those dopeheads did me a favor. As for those four little deadbeats, all but one of them were arrested for arson. One guy was already inside for trafficking. He just got another ten years slapped onto his sentence. Two others were on probation. They received ten themselves. The one remaining guy snitched on the others and only got five. As long as they stay away from me, I'm fine with the punishment. I get neighbors that care about me now. If I have a family in my future, I couldn't think of a better place to raise kids. After all, it's where I grew up, and my life's turned out pretty great. After my first divorce, I had neither a home nor job. A week's long search led me to our local branch of the National Arts and Crafts Store. I didn't have much retail experience, but they took a chance on me anyway. It wasn't long before my savings were running low. I began panicking that I'd end up on the streets. And just by chance, my boss overheard me telling my story of woe to another employee. She just happened to have a big, empty house and was looking for a roommate. The position was mine if I wanted it. I'd basically have a whole side of the house for myself. It sounded like an awesome opportunity, but I had my reservations. I wouldn't have that disconnect that most folks have between home and work. I got on with her really well, but there was a chance that we could get sick of one another. I wanted to take some time to think it over, but my present financial situation wouldn't allow it. With no obvious reasons not to, I accepted. That night after work, I began moving in. The house was amazing, and big. I'd never lived anywhere near this large, ever. My side was the size of your average single-family house. I asked how she could afford such a big place. It turned out that her husband had been an architect and owner of his own company. He planned the place out himself and had built it. Luckily, it got paid off before he passed away. Once her daughter moved out, the place became overwhelming. We sat down that evening and worked out the living situation with a few glasses of wine. She voiced some of the same concerns as I had myself. We decided it would be better if we worked different shifts and that was where our time as roommates began. The experience was relatively awesome for the most part. We would catch each other in passing as we came and went from work. On the rare night we were both off, we'd cook a big dinner and get to know one another. In a lot of ways, it was like the early years of a marriage. The time before the monotonies of life get in the way, I suppose. One of these dinners was the first time I met Lawrence. He was her on and off again boyfriend. The two had dated during college only to marry different people. After her husband's death, they renewed their affair. I wouldn't discover until later that Lawrence had a cheating problem that caused big gaps in their relationship. On the surface, he came across as a decent guy. His jokes were a tad blue at times, but he was handsome and charismatic enough not to appear crude. He wasn't around that much, so I never really got to know him. That would soon change, however. Lawrence would often stay the night. 
I'd run into him on occasion, but we didn't say much to each other. For some reason, one morning, he began flirting with me. It was one of my days off. I'd slept in and was having a late breakfast. He sat down at the table and began dropping hints. I thought he was kidding, and it soon became clear that he wasn't. Rather than throw a big fit, I laughed it off and retreated to my bedroom. This was, unfortunately, not the last time he did this. In fact, probably five times throughout the next year, he repeated his lurid come-ons. Things came to a head one evening when he did it with my boss standing across the room. I'd had a couple of glasses of wine, and it made me much less tactful. I blurted out, F off, sleazebag. I didn't realize how loud I'd been until our guests all turned and gawked at me. I went with my tried and true tactic of laughing it off. Everyone but my boss at least pretended to believe me. Her icy gaze could have cut me down right there and not long after, the party quickly began to wind down. The last guest left at around 1am. I hoped the incident from earlier had been forgotten but within minutes I could hear arguing coming from my boss's side of the house. I assumed they weren't coming out for the rest of the night. So I poured the last bottle into a glass and dropped down in front of the TV. The arguing soon wound down and I must have dozed off. Suddenly the connecting door opened loudly and my boss staggered out. She seemed cool at first, but her intent soon became obvious. She sat down next to me on the couch and began interrogating me about Lawrence and myself. I hesitated at first, not wanting to cause even more problems. She took my hesitation as an evasion tactic and blew up on me. She began ranting about me being a harlot and how I had taken advantage of her kindness. I tried to stand up for myself, but she wasn't hearing any of it. That was until I called her boyfriend a sleazy womanizer. The room went dead silent. Her jaw was hanging open and her eyes were bulging. Something told me that in that moment I should run. As it turned away, she began screaming at the top of her lungs. Just a few seconds later, I feel a painful thud across the back of my head. Things started to get blurry. I fought the weak feeling in my legs. I strained to take another step and then... darkness. When I came to, my ears were ringing and my vision was still a bit blurry. Everything came into focus at once. Standing there was my boss, looking down at me. I threw my hands up to defend myself only to hear her profusely apologizing over and over. I slowly lowered my hands, still unsure if it was a ploy. She continued apologizing. I sat up and rubbed the back of my head. I guess I thought it would soothe my pounding headache. Instead, I found a big wet spot and my hand was covered with blood. My boss saw that and started apologizing even more. She helped me to my feet and drove us to the hospital and by some miracle we didn't crash on the way. After that, the remainder of our night was spent at the ER. Despite my initial urge, I lied to the nurse and said I'd tripped and hit my head on the table. About the time the doctor mentioned stitches, I had decided then and there I was getting out of that house. She may have been sorry that time, but the next time, I may not be so lucky, and I knew that there would be a next time. Lawrence wasn't going anywhere, neither was he going to change. I kept my decision to myself until my boss was at work. While she was gone, I packed like a crazy person and headed for the cheapest motel I could find. Luckily, I had been saving for rent and had a good chunk set back. I left a note explaining my position as I slipped out that day. I went into work, like usual that evening. I had considered quitting, but I couldn't afford to. Until a problem reared its head, I was going to keep working. The storm I had expected never actually materialized. For the rest of my time working there, we only saw each other twice and neither person spoke to the other. I found a place of my own within the month and hadn't had a roommate since. I mean, really, can you blame me? Almost 10 years ago, I had paid off my mortgage and was looking for an area to invest in. I did a boatload of research, then forgot it all and bought a two-bedroom house around the corner from me. 
After six months of renovating, I decided to rent it out. I chose a 50-year-old woman and her son to be my first tenants. She was a normal, hard-working widow and her son was a quiet but well-mannered young man. They leased the house for a full ten years and I never once had any trouble with them. Then, out of the blue, I received a phone call from the mother letting me know that they wouldn't be resigning the lease. I inquired if there was anything that I could do to make her change her mind, but she said there was not. I wished her and Jeffrey, her son, good luck and assured her that I would give her a glowing recommendation if she needed it. At the end of that month, her and Jeffrey dropped off the key and said goodbye. After ten long years, I was without a tenant. I headed over the next morning to see what needed repaired or refreshed. As expected, the house was darn near the shape it was when they moved in. All they really needed was a coat of fresh paint and a deep cleaning. The landscaping was much the same. Jeffrey kept the grass cut and the shrubs well manicured. Unfortunately, the row of rose bushes he planted for his mother had to go. The early freeze from the year before had killed them. I hired a friend to do some painting and a maid service did the cleaning afterwards. While this was all being done, I began digging up the bushes. When I dug up the first one, I was surprised to find the skeleton of a small animal about the size of a cat. I figured it was more than likely once a pet of a former owner. Being an animal lover, it was a bit of a somber moment. I grouped together all the bones I could find, placed them into a small box and reburied them. I said a short prayer, redonned my hat and moved to the next bush. At the bottom of the next hole, I came across a black trash bag. For a split second, I got a crazy idea that it could be buried money. I cut it open and an awful stench hit me in the face. On closer inspection, I saw that it was another small animal, this time a little dog. I figured it couldn't be that old, maybe five years. Now I was starting to grow suspicious. I knew for a fact that Jeffrey and his mother never had a single pet, especially a dog. Unlike the last, I placed the dog back in its hole with no ceremony. Although it was highly unlikely, I was shooting for a triple. I hastily dug around the bush and yanked it from the earth. It wasn't long before my clawing at the soil paid off. In one big handful, a couple of small, long bones came out with the dirt. Another few minutes of digging and I had what looked to be the full skeleton of a cat or small dog. What started out as a calm day in the garden was quickly turning into a horrible slog through a mass animal grave. I wasn't sure what to think of all of this. Was my yard one big giant pet cemetery? And who put them here? Considering what I've already found, I couldn't stop with the rose bushes. Until the oncoming dark arrived, I dug and dug. I had no particular plan. If a part of grass looked disturbed, I made a hole. 90% of all the holes I dug that day yielded some part of an animal. Most were that of small animals, but one or two looked big enough to be Great Danes. The next day, I surveyed the yard with a clear head. It resembled a field taken over by fire ants. Countless hills of earth stretched out before me. Unsure of what else to do, I had reinterred each skeleton I unearthed. I stopped at 15. Assorted bones and skulls uh, mounted to maybe 25. I sat up that night battling with what I should do with this information. At first, I was determined to return and continue my search, but as I turned it over in my mind, I thought the better of it. The longer I kept this up, the more eyes may see what I was doing, and that would bring questions, and I wasn't prepared to tell my story. I didn't think my neighbors were ready to hear it. When one or two pets disappeared in a year, people tend to write it off. We lived very near to a large forested area. That forest was teeming with predators like coyotes. Their songs were a familiar part of our late nights. Even I was guilty of blaming our nocturnal neighbors. I'd never had a reason to blame Jeffrey. I'd never witnessed him behaving cruelly to any animal. However, as I think back in retrospect, he did seem to be a tad standoffish towards them. 
what I wrote off as fear, was perhaps a hidden disdain. This was all supposition at the end of the day. I may know that coyotes didn't kill these pets, but a few of them could have been buried before I bought the property. The house was built before I was born. There's no telling how many pets passed on between 1968 and 2000 when I purchased it. At most, I could pin three animals on Jeffrey. And then there's that. I have no proof he was the culprit. Maybe his mother was some nutso behind closed doors. Alas, I can try to justify everything, but we all know what happened here, don't we? I provided shelter to a monster. A monster that preyed upon the most defenseless of our families. Those that some see as children even. He did it right before our eyes. Perhaps for the entire ten years he lived there. What do you think my neighbors will think of me when they find this out? Maybe they'll even try to blame it all on me. It's been five years since that terrible weekend. Without any forwarding address or phone number to contact them, I've never been able to confront the pair about the dead pets. They'd be insane to admit it anyway. I was leery about renting the house out again, but a year passed and people began asking questions. There's been three renters since, and I made it annoyingly clear that they were not allowed to dig anywhere on the property. I've had a lot of time to think about what else may be buried on that lot. People's pets weren't the only creatures to go missing in those ten years. I'm not sure I'd ever be able to deal with finding someone's child under the sod of my own property. That being said, I may be a coward, but I'm not completely heartless. I've had a request to excavate the entire property added to my will. Now that I'm approaching my late 70s, I have type 2 diabetes and this new virus has arrived. There's a possibility you may be discovering my identity sooner than I'd hoped. At this point in life, I don't much care about how I'm remembered. I do, however, hope folks don't blame my family for my cowardice. Please don't be too hard on them. After all, it was potentially that demented young man who did all of those awful things, not them. A year ago, I had had enough of the city and moved to a quiet little place in rural Oregon. No matter how hard I tried, my cousin Jeremy couldn't be convinced to come with me. All his friends lived in and around Portland and he wouldn't leave them behind. With or without Jeremy, I was determined to get away. In just the past five or so years, the city had become completely different than the one it grew up in. Friends of all sorts of backgrounds and beliefs got along, but one day I woke up and noticed things had changed. We had broken up into two separate tribes, one that wanted things to remain the way they had always been and another angry and violent group that had a my way or else mindset. Kids had known each other for 20 plus years were now irrevocably split. This wasn't the worst of it. I've had friends come and go throughout my life. The violence was the deciding factor. More than once I witnessed my friends viciously attacking the elderly and infirm for no reason other than that they thought differently. I struggled with my choice for quite some time. That was until the day I became the focus of their ire. I was downtown and stopped by a group of these activists. When I asked for a reason, I was threatened. A guy I had known since grade school was among them. Rather than stand up for me, he turned and walked away. And that was the final straw. Just before Christmas of 2019, I made my move to the country. Jeremy no longer had a roommate, so he moved to a smaller efficiency apartment. Throughout the following months, he and I stayed in contact. Then the summer of 2020 ignited and Portland became a living nightmare. My fears had become a reality. Getting Jeremy out of the city consumed me now. We talked almost every day. He told me of all the carnage surrounding him. And then, one day, no more Jeremy. I called, texted, and emailed with no result. I called all of our mutual acquaintances, but they had nothing for me. A panic grew inside me. Every night the news was filled with stories of rioting and arson. I knew visiting his place in person was the only way to find out his fate. After putting off the trip for almost a week, I found the courage to return to the city. 
I don't know what I expected, but what I found wasn't good. There didn't exist a single block where at least one building hadn't at least been torched a little bit. Windows had been boarded up and slogans and curse words covered every surface. Despite the quiet atmosphere of the day, an underlying tension remained in the air. As I got closer to Jeremy's apartment, a sick feeling grew in the pit of my stomach. When I arrived at the address I'd been given, I initially thought it was a mistake. Before me stood the charred skeleton of a large building. Nearby, a few people stood, pointing and talking. I asked them what had happened and discovered rioters had burned it the week before. I lacked the courage to ask if anyone had died, but I didn't have to. A male in the group casually mentioned how sad it was that so many had lost their lives. Twelve, in fact. I couldn't handle it any longer. My knees buckled beneath me and I lost consciousness. When I came to, I was surrounded by a small group, many of the people I'd just been speaking to. I attempted to reassure them that I was okay, but the ambulance was already on its way. They took me in just to be safe. While I waited at the hospital, I inquired about the deaths at the apartment. My nurse gave me some information on how I could find out if Jeremy was among the dead. I got a ride back to my car and drove directly there. After waiting 30 minutes, I got what I'd wanted. Now, it was confirmed. Jeremy was indeed among the 12 lives lost in that fire. I'd never been more at odds with myself. He'd been like a brother to me for most of my life. His death was a stab to my heart, but more than grief, I felt an all-consuming rage. This war that we were surrounded by was senseless. The only people suffering were the innocent, people like Jeremy. He was the kindest and most open-minded man I knew. Logic no longer existed in this world and I was happy I was no longer a part of it. I returned to the country, my peaceful mountains, with Jeremy's ashes. I no longer had any reason to visit the city. If I could have, I would have destroyed the road behind me. Then, out of the blue, I received a phone call that would turn the world on its head. My life in the mountains was a world away from the disease-ridden bedlam I heard of on the radio. I'd gotten most of my seeds into the ground and was preparing for the oncoming warm weather. Everything stopped when I got a call from the Portland police. A terrible fact had been uncovered during their investigation of the arson. It was discovered that the landlord of the building was in fact the person responsible for the fire. His hope was that it would be written off as just another fire started by the protesters. He may have gotten away with it had not one of the people he had hired been busted for an unrelated crime. The guy flipped on him for a reduced sentence. When the owner was presented with all the proof, he confessed to the entire scheme. Twelve people lost their lives for an insurance check. For nothing. With a bit of hindsight, I suppose the identity of the person really doesn't matter. Many more may use this division among us to cover for their own dirty actions. Only by coming together can we foil their plans. With every innocent life lost in this mindless conflict, we grow further apart. Reach out to all those you care about and do everything you can do to find a common ground. Only then can we stop the world from falling down all around us. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts, Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.